Good evening, everybody. How are you? Good, I hope. Uh, I'm Al Seegers. I am the director of the Center for Sustainable Enterprise here at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I'm also the area head of the strategy and, and entrepreneurship department. And if I miss any more meetings, I'll probably be the head of something else uh, as time goes by. Now, uh, enjoy everything we do here. Tonight, we are honored to have with us Kelly McElhaney. And, and Kelly is the John C. Whitehead Faculty Fellow of Corporate Responsibility and the co-faculty director of the Center for Responsible Business at the Haas Business School at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, she's been very instrumental in driving the center activity there as well as the curriculum activity, and that's resulted in the Haas School being ranked number one, uh, the number one MBA program in corporate responsibility by Financial Times and number two by the Wall Street Journal. Uh, among many of her distinguished uh, awards and recognitions is the Faculty Pioneer Award by the Aspen Institute in 2005. Tonight she's here to talk to us about her new book, uh, Just Good Business, The Strategic Guide to Aligning Corporate Responsibility and Brand. She served as a consultant to several uh, leading corporations, including HP, Gap, eBay, McDonald's, Ernest & Young, Blue Cross Blue Shield, as well as Nokia. She holds a Ph.D. from Michigan, an M.A. from Ohio University, and most importantly, a B.A. from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Proud of that. Uh, tonight, uh, we also want to recognize some special guests. We have uh, many members of the, uh, the McElhaney clan who are here with us, so we want to recognize them. Uh, in particular, Gloria and Harold McElhaney are here, and there is a nice story about Harold McElhaney. Harold, where are you? Right here. Oh, Harold McElhaney. Um, actually got his Master's of Arts degree from Duke, but he is a big UNC fan. Or did I get that wrong? The other way didn't make any sense to me. No, actually it's reversed. He's got his uh, MA from UNC, but is a huge Duke fan. So welcome to the McElhaney family here. And more importantly, please welcome Kelly McElhaney. Thank you, Al. So I think it always is good form to uh, arrive at your presentation 10 minutes late, because <laughs> that helps the stress level. But thank you for having me here. Um, my father actually went to Duke undergrad, and you should know that my six-year-old daughter and nine-year-old daughter do not call him grandpa. They call him Dukey, because he is never without something that says Duke on it. Um, and beyond that, my sister is here, who wants me to announce that she's the real doctor in the family, because she's a medical doctor. Um, <laughs> and she went to NC State. but got her more important degree, which is her dental degree from Carolina. So the other person I want to recognize is somebody who I've never spoken in front of in my entire life, and that's a really scary thought. So I'm very sweaty palm tonight, because he is at once my best and biggest fan and my biggest critic. That's my grandfather, um, Pat Pat, who's here tonight, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So we'd kind of travel in mass, a bit like the Beverly Hillbillies, and when, I, <laughs> when I'm going, they're going. But uh, my grandfather is one of those rare people that if you were blessed enough to have in your life who every time I would go to visit him in Pittsburgh, I'd run into people that he knew or particularly he's a lead usher at the church and the other ushers would say, so your grandfather says you're the president of University of Michigan. I'd say, no, I'm just a, I'm just a PhD student. <laughs> and then the next time I go, so your grandfather tells us you're the mayor of San Francisco. I'm like, no, no, I'm just a faculty member at Berkeley. <laughs> but he just always elevates me. So yeah, I'm running for um, presidency next, uh, next election. <laughs> right, Pat Pat? Um, anyway. It's really an honor to speak in front of them. So I have this really great opportunity tonight to give my first book talk. My book actually goes to print tomorrow, so I don't have anything to sign for you. I have about three hours of work to do tonight to review the final, final, final version of it before it goes to the printer tomorrow. So this is kind of my trial audience, so I'm kind of going to take a lot of feedback tonight. But it is a book that will be out October 10th. And it's my first book, and it's called Just Good Business. And tonight I just want to tell you a little bit, first about myself and who I am and why I'm here, um, a little bit about why I do what it is that I do, which is actually, again, a, another blessing in my life besides my grandfather is the fact that I, I am doing my calling in life. And I suppose a lot of religious people tell you that, and I certainly at Berkeley don't do much that is in the religious way of doing things. But I do, I do feel like I am living my passion, which is a really big blessing and honor. This is me. 
Um, I'm a recovering banker. So you know people go to AA meetings and say, my name is Kelly and I'm an alcoholic. Well, I usually go and say, my name is Kelly and I'm a banker. And um, I got out of banking and ended up coming into academia, uh, mostly out of complete sheer and utter misery with my banking life. And I was in banking in the 80s, which is a little bit about how I started to understand corporate responsibility from perhaps a reverse methodology of seeing some corporate irresponsibility. I got my start at University of Michigan uh, Business School. I went there for my PhD and then ended up staying on. I've been out at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, at the Haas School of Business since 2002. And I came there to launch what became the Center for Responsible Business, which was launched in 2003. And we've had a really fun ride with it. Um, fast growth, lots of support from local business folks, from the dean, from the students for sure. We were rated this year as number one in the world. So when I read the ranking in the Financial Times accidentally because I was on an airplane and I picked up a pink newspaper because I was traveling at the time with my eight-year-old daughter and she thought it was cool that there was a pink newspaper. And she picked it up and I was looking at it on the plane and unbeknownst to me they ranked business schools for the first time ever. Not that they ranked business schools, but it was the first time they ranked business schools in the area of corporate social responsibility. So I found that to be kind of interesting, and I was reading it, and lo and behold, they rated Haas as number one in, in um, corporate responsibility, which was just a huge shock to me. But I'm sitting in an airplane where nobody knows me, so I can't really share it with anybody other than my daughter, who was sound asleep, who I immediately woke up and told her what it said. And uh, my father, who is a retired academic, academician, always taught me that it's, people don't leave academia very often. They stay for a really long time. It's one of the challenges of academia. And he always said, Kelly, one of the best lessons you can lear learn in academia is to know when to leave, to gracefully leave. So I decided about two minutes after reading the number one ranking that it was a really good time to step aside from the center. And we just brought in a new full-time director of the center so I can just go back and be a faculty member at the business school. I do a lot of corporate consulting and get great energy out of that because I wouldn't have been able to do things like write a book if it weren't for the wonderful pioneering corporate corporations and CEOs and leaders who are out there testing the waters in this little known space of corporate social responsibility. And indeed, I'll talk about some of those tonight. And my research focus is in the area, uh, three, three main areas. My training is in corporate strategy, so I really look at how corporate social responsibility, or CSR, can be used as a business strategy and how it can enhance business return. It's not to say I don't care about the environmental return. That's not at all to say I don't care about the social return. But I've always I've had the luxury of teaching in top 10 business schools, and I know very clearly that I have to teach something that is linked to creating wealth or protecting wealth. Because at the end of the day, that's what businesses exist to do. That's what we're measured on, and that's how they remain sustainable. So I look at corporate social responsibility as it is a business strategy, which I'll tell you about in a little bit. That's one area of research that I do. The other area is dead on this topic of this book, which is how do you communicate, once you get the strategy down right, how do you actually start to communicate it and use it as the powerful tool that it can become? Because if you aren't communicating it, if you're not telling your CSR story, you're losing 90% of the effectiveness of corporate social responsibility as a powerful business tool. And my third area of research, which I absolutely adore, it's not so much in this book, it's a little subversively peppered into this book, but my publisher was very shrewd and said, if you write this book about diversity and gender, it'll get shoved off into a marginalized shelf in the, book, in the bookstore. But my third area is really looking at how corporate social responsibility has proved to be a hook to re-engage diverse and really sought after audiences with business. That being the female market, both as employees, because they're, they're, they're leaving the top tiers of business at record numbers in the United States, but as consumers, as suppliers, and also some other diverse audiences, which I'll talk about. And as Al rightly said, I am a Tar Heel. I put my graduation year up there, then I took it off. Then I put it back up, and then I took it off, but I decided, ah, well. It is what it is. So I am a Tar Heel from, from 1988. So that's who I am. It's great. It looks really nice and neat and tidy, right? It all makes sense. People say, how did you get where you're going? And it, you know, it's funny, it always looks like it's a really linear path. Well, it turns out it's not at all, because what I wanted to be was Wonder Woman. <laughs> but that didn't work out so well, so I became a professor instead. But this, just so you know, this is who I wanted to be. I thought tonight, particularly for this audience, since I'm back in my um, alma mater in my homeland, I would attempt to dig a little deeper. People ask me a lot, how did you get into corporate social responsibility? How did you get where you are? Because you seem so happy and you're so passionate about what you're doing and I want to do it, so I want to follow your path. Which is a tough question, right? Because I, I don't know too many people who took the path that was linear and straight and it's what they thought they were going to be doing. So my usually flip answer is, well, I was a banker in the 80s. 
enough said. I got to see a lot of corporate irresponsibility, and I knew that there needed to be another way. But it turns out, as I was preparing for the talk tonight, that it, I do owe a lot. And is anybody here from the campus why? Good, because I know they're going to ask me for money if this gets back to them. But I do owe a whole lot of how I got where I am today to UNC, because as you know, college is just, in general, a formative time in one's life. And I think I sort of undermine how formative UNC was for a whole host of reasons, which I won't go into tonight. But I wanted to mention a few things that, that happened to me in my life, primarily before UNC and at UNC, that really sort of woke me up to this concept of inequity in, in the world or the lack of social justice in the world. Um, the first is surely being, brought, being born Catholic, right? Because I was born, and I think one of the first things that somebody ever said to me was, you have sinned. And I'm like, wait a minute, I just, I just was born today. How could I have sinned? Well, you know, when you're Catholic, you're born with original sin. So I think I, early on, at a, at a young age, for nobody's fault or reason, grew up with a lot of guilt just because I was in the world. You know, and, you know, you just learn a lot about guilt. Anybody Catholic in the audience? You know what I'm talking about, right? Anybody Jewish in the audience? You know what I'm talking about, too. It's the one thing I found that there is an overrepresented group in the corporate social responsibility st space of people who were either are or were brought up Catholic or Jewish. And I think a lot of it has to do with guilt. So I had to put a picture of a church up there because I think that that has helped shape my calling in life. The other is a picture of my little buddy. So the Campus Y ran, I suppose they still do, a program called the Little Buddy Program, which is the campus version of Big Brothers, Big Sisters program. And I came to University of North Carolina from Ohio. So, you know, I, I didn't grow up poor. I didn't grow up rich. I grew up pretty comfortably. And I remember a couple of things. You know, you look back on your college four years, and you're supposed to remember your biology, your astrology, all of the things that you took in the classroom. And it turns out I don't remember much of that, pretty much nothing about what I learned in the classroom. But I remember a couple of shaping experiences during my four years here at Carolina. The first was standing in line in freshman orientation with my high school friend, Beverly Lester, who had come here with me from Ohio. And um, somebody in line saying, where are you from, where are you from? And they were from Charlotte or Atlanta. Pretty much I heard that same thing over and over. Where are you from, Ohio? And I got a lot of interesting comments about Ohio. Is that, did you, is that a lot of, of cornfields there? Is that like out by Iowa? Or no, you're by Idaho, right? And it was honest to God, my first time which I thought, the world's a pretty big place and we don't know a lot about one another. You know, they, they just had no idea where Ohio was from. The second comment I got was that my sophomore year, I was waiting in line to rush a sorority. And um, people were talking about their debutante balls, but they were talking about debbing back and forth. When, when did you deb and what did you wear and who, who were you with? And somebody asked me if I debbed and I was so completely perplexed and I said, my name's Kelly. Like, I don't know, <laughs> I had no idea what they were talking about. And it was the first time I realized that maybe I wasn't as worldly as I thought I was, that it was a much larger world than Athens, Ohio. Um, the, second was, the third thing was also just being in the sorority and um, just seeing things that I hadn't really witnessed before. One minor story I remember is a girl, we were going to the bookstore to buy our books and I was writing a check and I was really worried that I was going to actually use the majority of my checking account to buy my books. And she had a credit card that she whipped out and it was her dad's. And I thought that was such a foreign concept to me. Like, wait, it's not your, your dad pays for this? And it was just this interesting concept of, of equity in the world. Um, my three roommates my sophomore year were all Moorhead scholars, which was fascinating because one was from Turtle Creek Drive in Dallas, which is a pretty phenomenally wealthy place. And so I just had a hard time reconciling the fact that she was coming to Carolina completely free and being paid and given summer internships. But she was from Turtle Creek Drive in Dallas. And, and had more money than God. Um, and so my sophomore year, because I was having all this challenge of how do I put this together? How is it that we're building shanties on central campus to um, protest against anti-apartheid? But these kids are driving back in their BMWs to their posh apartments after protesting against South Africa. I was very confused. So I got into this program that was called the Big Buddy Little Buddy Program at the Campus Y. And I got this little buddy, and this was my first little buddy. She's a very, very sweet little girl. And I picked her up one day. I had an, um, a, an old beater car. Remember, Daddy used to burn out the clutch like every six months. And so I had this car, and I drive up. And she lived in a trailer park here just outside of town. And I picked her up. And I just remember thinking, wow, it's just, things just don't smell very, very appetizing here. And I got inside and met her mom, and you know we had a quick chat, and I brought Rachel into my car, and it was just really a bad smell. So we started chatting a little bit, and she admitted to me that they hadn't had running water in their trailer for eight months. 
So she hadn't had a shower or a bath or even washed in eight months. And that was just such a high impact moment for me because I lived at that point in this sorority house, which was nicer than my house now is in San Francisco. And I brought her back to the sorority house and she took a shower and I gave her a sweatshirt, which was ironic now, right? But a Harvard sweatshirt, it's kind of bizarre that that's what I decided to give her to wear. And we just had this phenomenal relationship for my time here that I was at college. And again, it was just one of those moments where you think the world is so much bigger than what you see just out your front door or what you see on central campus. And she had a huge impact on me, um, which leads to a lot of things that I do today in my life uh, around just getting out of my comfort zone, maybe is the best way to say it. And certainly as a business school PhD student, getting out of my comfort zone was doing things that talked about business being a positive social force. And that's kind of what led me to my path today. So the book is a story. It's actually written as a story because my underlying theme here is that we live in a time today where there's a lot of power in storytelling. And it's underutilized. It's an underutilized tool, particularly from the business sector. So it's three parts. The first part of the book, I really talk about what is corporate social responsibility because it's exploded over the past 10 years, which is great in many ways because it's very popular now. It's very mainstreamed. The downside is that people don't really know. They use it to mean a lot of different things, and we're not all talking about the same thing. So I kind of try to rein it in and say, what is corporate social responsibility, and how can it become a powerful part of your business strategy? The second part of the book, which is really the crux of the book, is where I lay out seven rules of the road to use effectively corporate social responsibility as a brand strategy tool. And then the third part of the book is really, because I know that the readers are, are meant to be busy business folks, what are you going to do Monday morning when you get into the office to start to implement some of this? It's not esoteric academic theory that doesn't have any application. It's really what are you going to do? Don't forget that there are risks associated, just as there are risks associated with anything that you do in business, and how can you mitigate against some of those risks? So the big ideas of the book. There's a lot of CSR in the world today. Everywhere you go, companies have 90-page CSR reports, have a big section of their internet site which talks about what they do in the community, have press, PR, news stories, a lot around CSR. But there's not a lot of effective strategic CSR for a whole host of reasons which I lay out in the book, not the least of which is businesses don't view it as a business strategy. They view it as something that's nice to do. So they tend to do a lot of things, and none of them very well. Of the good, effective, strategic CSR that's out there, very few companies are communicating it. They just are very fearful right now to talk about it for a whole host of reasons. And what I ended up talking about in the book or trying to lay out is that this is a powerful tool that's being left on the table. And it, it's really the focus of branding, and it's not just branding to your consumers. That's just one group to whom you brand. In fact, a lot more of the power from corporate social responsibility is branding to your employees, branding to suppliers, branding to new governments that you're trying to enter, branding to new communities in which you're trying to build a factory or, or a new store, um, branding to new market segments you don't capture right now. So it's looking at how corporate social responsibility, when done well, can be used as a powerful branding tool. We know that corporate social responsibility has gone mainstream. You'd have to really... Um, be living under a rock lately to not have seen something in the space of corporate social responsibility on major periodicals, major journals. And you now know that it's completely mainstream because the manly men are getting it, because now it's even on the cover of Sports Illustrated. And it's on the cover of Sports Illustrated in a way that really speaks to the manly men or the athletic women. I shouldn't just pick on men because my sister has a subscription to Sports Illustrated. So it's women too. It talks about it in a way that says, hey, look, guys, if global warming continues at the pace at which it's moving today, all of your beloved baseball fields, or three quarters of them, will be underwater because they're on coastal towns in, in America. The golf courses won't exist because of just the inefficient way in which they use water, in which they use um, artificial turf, artificial grass. It talks about if Hank Aaron had done the same thing today, he wouldn't have hit any real world record because of the higher level of particulates in the air, and the ball wouldn't have gone as quickly. So it was done, I think, for Sports Illustrated in an incredibly effective way because they didn't talk about carbon sequestration, which most Sports Illustrator readers don't care suit too much about. They talk about it in a way that makes sense to their audience. Here's what would the impact on your love, your passion would be. Here's the impact on sports. As I said earlier, we see a lot of corporate social responsibility messaging out there. Not effective messaging, but we see it 
in reports and corporate social responsibility strategies and corporate social responsibility branding and advertising, um, but it's still not done in an effective fashion. And so what I say to that is it's a lost opportunity because if I walk into a company and say, what's your corporate strategy? Most business leaders would tell me it's really easy. We focus on three things in this company, growth, efficiency, and increasing capital, increasing access to capital. And every person inside of that company tax their sales every day towards some impact, some motivation, some movement, some strategy that's linked towards growth, efficiency, or access to capital. If I then walk into a company and say, what's your corporate social responsibility strategy? They look at me a little oddly. I've even had CEOs say, I'll say, what's your CSR strategy? And they'll say, you know, we don't have customer service representatives here. I say, okay, so tell me what you do in the area of community involvement or what's your foundation do? And then they, their eyes light up and they're like a kid in a candy store. Oh yeah, here's the list of organizations we support. Here's the list of causes that we support. And it reminds me of that sort of spaghetti against the wall theory where whatever didn't slide off the wall gets stuck and becomes their strategy. Or better yet, whatever nobody else knows what to do with or wants to manage gets thrown under corporate social responsibility. Or better yet, whatever board the CEO's wife sits on becomes their corporate social responsibility strategy because she's passionate about it. And it's just not effective. It's not linked to what the company wants to do in the area of growth efficiency or access to capital. It's not linked to what the company does well in terms of their core competencies. It's just this smattering of things that feel good but possibly don't make sense to the company. And so what my favorite line to any CEO who asks me this and I take them through this exercise is, you're, you're leaving an opportunity on the table. You're leaving an incredibly valuable opportunity on the table and they know that when I say opportunity, that means money and they don't like to leave money on the table. Why corporate social responsibility today? Why has it exploded? Well, the book outlines a whole lot of reasons of why it's exploded, but the one that I think has incredible impact is even if you don't believe any of the other drivers that this generation is really calling for it, that companies like Nike went through significant pain on their public relations and reputation, which also impacted their share price, um, access to globalization and new markets meant that we had to do things differently. The fact that you can log on onto the internet at any given time and find over 100 I hate Nike websites and they'll tell you exactly why you should hate Nike. This whole transformation of business models. If you don't believe in any of that, just consider the following. If you look at the 100 top economies in the world today as measured by GDP or revenue, it only takes to get to number 22 until you see a company. That is to say, Exxon is richer than 78% of the countries in the world. Think about that. Exxon is richer than 78% of the countries in the world, and yet we're quick to say it's the country government job who should take care of labor standards. It's the country and the government who should take care of education and health care and social services. But wait a minute. Exxon is richer than 78% of you countries. So it just seemed like a bad ROI here that we were saying it's up to the countries to take care of these problems. ExxonMobil had the most profitable year ever in the history of capitalism last year, ever. Walmart is number 25, so Walmart is richer than 75% of the con countries in the world. At the end of the day, who else is gonna change the world than the people who occupy the resources? And I think right now we exist in a time, whether we like it or not, in which companies occupy the majority of the resources. So I go through the book about all these prevailing definitions of corporate social responsibility, but because it's my book, I got to put my definition forward for the rest of the book, which was kind of fun, because for once nobody had to disagree with me, because I wrote it alone. <laughs> so the way I look at corporate social responsibility is that it's a business strategy, it's a corporate strategy, and it's linked to two things up front. Core business objectives, so if you're Hewlett, Hewlett Packard and it's growth, efficiency, and access to capital, then your CSR strategy should support growth, access to capital, and increasing efficiency. The second thing that your CSR strategy should be linked to is your core competencies, what you do, what you do well. You know, I didn't go get a little buddy because I was good with kids. But it turns out I am good with kids, and it was a great fit for me. Because it was, I, I t look at my life, I coach and mentor people, kids. I mean, they're not kids anymore, but they feel like kids sometimes when you're getting as old as I am. So it made good sense for me looking back. It was accidental that I became a big sister. 
because I was able to coach and mentor my little sister through some difficult times in her life. That's somebody who took some personal responsibility and linked it to things that they already did well. It's the same thing for a company. Pick a cause or a problem in the world for which you actually own part of the solution, and I'll show you an example of this in a minute. And again, I unapologetically say up front, and people have a very difficult time with this, particularly in Berkeley, I say this is designed to bring financial value back to the firm. It has to, because any good corporate strategy has to be linked to financial value to the firm, or it will cease to exist as a corporate strategy, and the firm will cease to exist, and so it's a moot point. So unapologetically, it's linked to providing financial value to the firm as well as, at the same time as, providing positive environmental value or social value. It's got to be embedded, embedded in the culture of the firm and in the day-to-day -day operations of the firm. That's the definition I, I lay out in the book, and it's really the defining factor of how I've done my work. So two things. It has to be linked to your business objectives. And it's hard sometimes to get companies to really focus on the true business objectives. It's very easy to say increase sales or grow, because that's what every company says they want to do. But what are the second, third, and fourth business objectives that are going to support growth? Is it to triage some employee turnover that you're suffering from? When I went to work for eBay, you know, Meg Whitman said growth, growth, and growth. Very easy. Those are our three corporate objectives. And her HR director was slinking under the table because she knew that they had an 85% turnover rate. And she was saying, you know, Meg, at some stage it's going to be hard to grow, grow, and grow if we keep bleed, bleed, bleeding employees over to Yahoo and Google. So that was their second business objective. Their third business objective was to, to do business in China. So what's it going to take to enter China? Well, could corporate social responsibility as part of your business strategy compendium help you enter China more effectively so that you can, Meg, grow, grow, and grow? But it's hard to get people past that number one business objective. And the second is to figure out what it is you do well as a company. And most companies will say one thing, but when it turns out, when you really dig a little bit more deeply, they do a whole different set of, of things. You know, at eBay, for example, we had a two-hour discussion about what their core, their core competencies were, and they just couldn't figure it out. It turns out that they create markets. I mean, what eBay does is create markets, and people come. So once they realized that that was their core competency, they created a market and purchased World of Good, which is to bring indigenously produced art from all over the world to an eBay marketplace, like an eBay vertical, so people could log on and buy things that were produced in Haiti that, also, that are fabulous art pieces or baskets or you know, iron statues, but also supported economic growth inside of Haiti. So I really try to get firms to, to use that as their filter. And anything that isn't linked to a core business objective or a core competency, I tell them to kind of ease back on a little bit. Now, that is not to say when a hurricane happens, companies shouldn't rush to, to do disaster relief that may not be linked to their core business objectives. They should do it in an area in which they're competent, but there are always things, initiatives that companies do that aren't necessarily linked. But for good, effective corporate social responsibility, I try to get firms to link it to these two factors. And then the final comment I'll make on corporate social responsibility is the following, and it's been a huge transformation in how the world views corporate social responsibility, particularly over the past five years. So it used to be that people thought Corporate responsibility was going out there and making as much money as possible at all costs, just make big piles of money, and then throw a little bit of it off into a cause, to naming a ballpark, to a museum, to disaster relief. And what I'm trying to say in this book is it's not really actually how you spend the money you make after you've already made it. The big change today is that corporate social responsibility is actually how you make your big piles of money. And it's a, it sounds like it's a minor nuanced difference, but it's huge. And once a company understands that, it transforms the second part of the book, which is the story that they can tell. Because it's a much more effective story if it is actually how the company made its wealth, as opposed to making big pots of money and then throwing a little bit of off into 100 different causes. So the second part of the book, I lay out these seven principles, which I'm not going to go through tonight because I don't have time and I want you to buy the book. So I'm just going to go through a couple of the principles tonight. But this is really what makes the effective storytelling piece. And I want to be really clear here, because of course I've already been criticized. I mean, I work in an academic institution, so I was criticized the day I got my PhD. But it's, it's, I'm not saying brand your corporate social responsibility at all costs. I'm saying first, develop effective strategic corporate social responsibility. Have content, have substance, and then tell your story. If you reverse those two things, you're messing up because people's access to information is lightning pace. And if you try to tell your story first, 
Somebody's going to figure you out before you have substance to back it up. And even though that's everybody's fear when they hear me talk about this topic, I've never once worked with a company ever who wanted to tell their corporate social responsibility first. In fact, my experience with my extensive corporate consulting is the exact opposite. Hewlett Packard has been at corporate social responsibility for 40 years, and they're scared to death to tell their story. Don't know why, lots of theories, 90% engineers, so they don't communicate anyway. It, they only communicate after they're 2,000% right, and they can prove it. Whole host of theories. The bottom line is Dell comes out with this fancy, we'll plant a tree every time you buy one of our printers, and they are now lauded as the number one environmental computer firm out there. And it's not because they have the history, it's not because they have the substance, it's because they told their story first. So what I actually really find is that companies have all this substance in the back room and they aren't talking about it. And I thought that was an opportunity to write a book. So the first example of a company who I think, just in the branding, I'm not saying their CSR story is perfect. I'm not saying their strategy is, is fantastic. Um, any company, you know, the other interesting thing about CSR, which I've actually felt more personally, but I see it with companies too, is that the minute you tell somebody you're trying to be good, as an individual or as a company, what do you think their nature, what do you think the nature of human beings is after you say you're good? What do I try to do? <laughs> Prove how he's bad. I, I look at YouTube, I look at Google, I try to find 16 ways in which, no, he's not good at all, he's really bad. I mean, I've had ama amazing comments made to me. I can't believe you wear a diamond ring and you're focused on corporate social responsibility. Huh? I can't believe you shop as much as you do, and yet you're focused on social responsibility. Huh? Like, I don't get that connection. Um, and companies, too. The minute they come out and try to say they're doing something good, human nature is to punish them and to try to find out 60 ways in which they're really bad. So it's incumbent on companies, A, to know that there's risk associated with this, that no good deed goes unpunished in today's world. It's a sick fact of nature, but it's true. And that they're going to get criticized. But think about what you want to be criticized for. Because there are a lot of things I would choose not to be criticized for, but trying to do good in the world is one of them that I say, have at it, people. Take shots at me because I wear diamonds or I shop. I don't care. There are far worse things than funding a school in Haiti or working with Dow Chemical Company on their clean drinking water. Because if I had to take bets on who's going to really solve the clean drinking water problem in the world, I'd say Dow Chemical Company is one who has a sure shot at it because of their core competencies and their water purification systems. So again, I'm not saying Whirlpool is 100% good, but check this out. A key, an ordinary house key. But to someone who's never had a home of their own before, a key is precious metal. It opens more than just a door. It opens up a whole new way of life. That's why Habitat for Humanity is so close to my heart. The people at Whirlpool feel the same way. Whirlpool donates a refrigerator and a range to every Habitat home. It's a good day! And every year, thousands of Whirlpool employees volunteer their time for Habitat. Everyone deserves a decent, affordable home. And together, we can make that happen. One family at a time. So I'm in North Carolina, there might be some Reba fans. Usually when I play this in California, people are like, ah. <laughs> Reba McIntyre? Anybody a Reba fan in here? Mom, raise your hand. <laughs> this is a really powerful combination. What does Whirlpool produce? Appliances for the home. What's a fantastic cause for Whirlpool to embrace? Homelessness, building homes for people. From a business perspective, this makes good sense because the more homes there are, the more appliances they will sell. And this is Whirlpool saying, we could partner with 50 organizations and throw a little bit of money towards each of them, a little bit of product towards each of them, or we could say we're gonna have one commitment for 11 years thus far. We're gonna give them money, which is typically the entry point for companies when they get involved in corporate resp responsibility. It comes from a more philanthropic position. So they started by just giving them money from their foundation, which wasn't the company, it was very separate. Then they said, you know what, we should be doing, the, doing more than giving them money, we should be actually giving them our ENERGY STAR appliances. 
This is a population, habitat homeowners are a population who live on a low disposable income, so we should give them our most energy efficient products. And we should actually combine where we're giving our money with where we're giving our product, as opposed to many companies who give money here, product there, and the tween never meets. Then Whirlpool came back and said, we promote employee volunteerism heavily as a company. It's just a philosophy that we really promote. Hey, wouldn't it be cool if we actually sent our employees out to volunteer at the same place where we're giving product, which, by the way, is the same place where we're giving money? Because you start to see it as an integrated strategy. But even then, it's still transformed inside of the company. The brand director said about three years ago, you know, it strikes me that I have a really tough job as a brand director for Whirlpool. Because basically my job is to take a big, rectangular, cold piece of metal and make it seem human and sexy and grabbing. Well, I can't really do that with a refrigerator. It's a very commoditized product. When you walk into a Sears, they all look pretty similar. But I could tell a story about Habitat and Whirlpool's partnership and our commitment to helping people get out of the state of homelessness that really brings my brand to life, differentiates me against my competitors, and, and creates a much higher level of customer loyalty, employee satisfaction and pride, and sales, ultimately. And it turns out inside of Whirlpool, it's worked. I have lots and lots of data that, that shows how corporate responsibility works for a company. They hate like heck for me to share it with you. Because if I had shown you this slide first, and then the slightly heart-tugging commercial, you would have felt a little more cynical. Well, they're just doing this because they're, they're making money off of it. And it's as if somehow, because they're making money off of it, that woman who gets her new house, somehow it's been tainted. And I say, absolutely not, because the more money they make, the more people are going to get homes, because it's a business strategy, and it's working for them as a firm. And it's a brilliant concept. And Whirlpool is leaps and bounds ahead of most companies, because they have one cause. They own a piece of that cause. And they've stuck with it, and they're starting to tell their story. Doesn't mean they get product take back fully doesn't mean they're absolutely getting rid of um, hydrofluorocarbon use in their refrigeration process. They're working on all those aspects, and I would argue that they're working more heavily on those aspects because they're communicating this, and they're being held to a higher standard. So it's a win-win on all levels, and it's a really nice, effective strategy. I don't have internet connection tonight, but, so I can't show you the commercials, but do go online because they will bring a tear to your eye if you, if you haven't seen the pedigree pet adoption commercials where they show this just fabulously gorgeous mutt looking dog in his cage and he's just sort of watching these people walk by from inside the cage in the animal shelter and he gets all excited and stands up and wags his tail when somebody comes close to his cage and then you just see the feet walk on. It's tear jerking, right? What a beautiful, simple concept. Pedigree makes dog food. It makes sense for them to say we want dogs to get out of shelters and into pedigree buying homes. So their cause is to partner with the SPCA and say we're going to help animal adoption process. We're going to help get animals out of homelessness and into loving homes. They have a fantastic website that isn't just pomp and circumstance and these tear jerking commercials, although those are very effective. It's actually highly educational. So you, you get onto the website and there's all this information. If you're a pet shelter and you want to apply for um, grants and support from this campaign, then here's where you go. If you're somebody who's interested in just learning more about the campaign, watch these commercials. If you're somebody who's interested in adopting a dog, well, don't be the average American who watches the movie 101 Dalmatians when it came out, and everybody went out the next week and got a Dalmatian, because it was such a cute movie, and we saw 101 little Dalmatians running around. And the next week, guess what the biggest contribution to animal shelters were? Dalmatians, because it turns out, well, they don't love kids, so they, eat, they bite your kids. It turns out that they need a ton of space to run in, so if you live in New York City, not a good dog. It turns out they need somebody around. You can't just keep them in your house for eight hours a day because they eat your drywall, and they'll chew through to get outside. So Pedigree says we're going to be a little bit more proactive, and we're actually going to educate. So there's this really great drop-down menu space where it says, are you thinking about adopting a dog? Do you have kids? If so, what ages? Are you living rural or urban? Do you run exercise, or do you, do you want a hearth dog who's going to sit and look pretty by your fireplace? And it then tells you what perfect dog breeds for you would be. You enter your zip code, and it tells you which shelters actually have those dogs logged into their system today. So it's highly educational. It's simple. Help us help dogs is their tagline. Nothing about carbon sequestration. Nothing about human energy, which is Chevron's campaign slogan right now, which just doesn't mean anything to me. 
Help us help dogs. The last thing that this campaign does, aside from just being a nice fit and being simply messaged, is that it, most consumers are incredibly busy, and we want to just do things that, so we can check off our list and say, we've done a good deed today. So they give you an option to do something, buy a bag of pedigree, and a percentage of your purchase price goes to support dog shelters. Check, I'm done, I feel good, I don't want to adopt a pet, I already have three. I don't want to adopt a pet because I hate dogs, but I want to do something to make me feel good today. Check, so I'm done, I can go to bed and go to sleep and feel good about myself. Fast, easy, and simple. And that's a big component of what I say in this branding piece of the book is you've got to be simple and you've got to get consumers involved. They want to do something. Don't just tell consumers what you do as a company. Tell them how they can get involved with you to do it too. Again, m many companies will tell me all kinds of excuses for not getting involved in corporate social responsibility. Well, you know, I don't want, why, you know, I remember a CEO who will remain, remain nameless. This is about six years ago now, but he said, why would I want to get my company involved in corporate social responsibility? Nike did, and look what happened to them. You know, I, people are just going to call me out on the carpet for it. Um, the other famous line I get is, we have no budget right now. Where are we going to get? It's a bad economy. How am I going to get more resources? And I'm saying, guys, it's not new resources. It's not new spend. It's stuff that you're already doing. Every company brands heavily. Every company advertises heavily. Every company sponsors. They do human resources activities. They do diversity strategies. It's taking pieces of all of that and allocating it or integrating it in with your corporate social responsibility strategy. And it doesn't have to be expensive. So this is a story from my daughter. So it's in the book, and she's really proud because she's now going off and telling all of her friends that she's published. <laughs> but um, I was at home with my then eight-year-old daughter and six-year-old daughter on a Saturday, and I was making them lunch, and I heard my older daughter scolding my younger daughter, which is a common occurrence in my house, so I wasn't paying too much attention to it. And she was saying, Juliana, don't take so many napkins. You don't need so many napkins. And Juliana was doing what any self-respecting younger sister would do, and she was completely ignoring her older sister because we do this. We have to grow up ignoring our older sisters. And um, I was making peanut butter and jelly, and I wasn't paying too much attention because it seemed like just a normal fight in my house, which happens quite a few times a day. But I, I should have paid attention because their voices started to raise a couple of levels in octave. And Isabel, Juliana's ignoring Isabel, so she's just pissed off. But she's smart, and she decides to, do, to tell the story to Juliana about why not to take napkins in a way that would resonate with Juliana. So anybody who knows my younger daughter knows that she adores animals. I mean, absolutely adores them. You find snails and slugs in her underwear drawer. You find um, roly polies all the time in her pajama drawer that she saved from the outside. Of course, they're completely hardened and crusted because they've been in her drawer, but she saved them from the, the wicked outdoors. So Isabel decides to tell Juliana where paper, where napkins come from that comes from paper, and where does paper come from. And at this point, Juliana's completely riveted with big eyes because Isabel's explaining to her that uh, paper comes from trees, and you have to cut down a tree to make paper. And we know who lives in trees, right, Juliana? And she says animals live in trees. So they're cutting down these trees to make more paper so you can use more napkins. And at this point, Juliana's eyes are starting to puddle up with big giraffe tears. And she says, but mommy, then where do the animals go? Where do the squirrels go? And when they cut down the tree, how do they find their mommies and daddies? And they both burst into tears. And I'm just thinking I'm making lunch. And I actually stupidly will admit that I was feeling a little bit proud because I thought Al's laughing at this point as a seasoned parent. I thought I had something to do with this scene and I'm feeling pretty brilliant. And so I put down what I'm doing and I go over and mop up the tears and tell Isabel how proud I am of her for, for the story. And I said, did you, did you learn this from mommy? She's like, huh? She said, no. Um, she had had soccer practice the night before and Bobby's daddy took them to an ice cream store which is owned by Dryers, which is owned by Unilever, multinational corporation. And there was a sign by the napkin dispensers in the, in the little ice cream scoop shop that showed, said one napkin per customer, please. And this just clicked with her, and she realized exactly why one napkin per customer. It was not a million-dollar Ogilvy ad campaign that took 16 directors and creative directors and TV and print and media. It was a very simple messaging process that happened for free inside this store that has had profound impact, at least in my household, particularly if you come in and try to use a lot of toilet paper or paper towels or leave the water running when you're brushing your teeth because they monitor these sorts of things. Profound impact, and it was pretty much free. And this was Unilever. This was not Unilever saying, we have this multinational global initiative. This was Unilever saying, as a company, we promote and support saving the earth, making the world a better place. And so an ice cream scoop shop owner felt empowered enough 
that he had a local school, a local class in a school develop these signs for his store for free. Big impact, simple messaging. My other favorite story, one of my principles is to start inside your company first. Most companies want to start outside with a big elaborate branding campaign because that's where they're feeling the pain. Some NGO has just dumped you know, 10,000 refrigerators on their front step. There's been some kind of negative blemish on their uh, reputation, so they start by reaching out across the world and giving their, their message, telling people how good they are, and they forget to engage inside the company. And what I say to companies is your most powerful branding starts with your employees. Because it turns out when you look at all the statistics of a, where consumers or individuals go to find out a company's corporate social responsibility strategy, it's the internet. It's blogs, it's YouTube, it's MySpace, it's, um, what's the other one, MySpace and Facebook, thank you. It's all of these sort of people like you and me. We believe people like you and me. We don't necessarily, even though we like the Reba McIntyre commercial, we know at some stage it was produced by Whirlpool, so we're not sure we believe it. They believe people like you and me. It turns out when you ask a consumer what the number one thing they think about in terms of a company being socially responsible is, it's treating their workers fairly. It's not saving a river in Tanzania. It's not carbon sequestration. The first thing a consumer or an average citizen thinks about is, do they treat their workers fairly? Because at the end of the day, all of us either currently are or someday will be a worker. And we are still very individualistic and we want to think about how it impacts us first. So there is a company who I think has gotten this incredibly well. And in my entire career, my career in corporate social responsibility, I honestly never thought I'd be up here citing this company. This is a company who has this fabulous little deck of cards, and it's called the Personal Sustainability Project. And on the back of each card is a sustainability question. So this one is lowering your thermostat just blank degrees during the winter saves 6% of heating-related CO2 emissions. Multiple choice. 15 degrees, 20 degrees, 25 degrees, or just 2 degrees? And the answer is 2 degrees. So it's a 52-card deck that they have given to every employee. They've actually given them two and said, keep one in your desk, and when you're bored, play it. Take one home and let your kids play it. And in fact, it's on um, my coffee table at home, and my kids love this deck of cards and stumping each other. So they've trained all of their employees in it. They've also put it in all of their break rooms. And because of the size of this company, they have really large break rooms. So one day here in North Carolina, in Hendersonville, I think, I have to get the town right. Anybody from Hendersonville? Good, then you won't know if I'm lying. So it's Hendersonville. <laughs> there was an employee named Daryl Myers, true name. He's a store associate, and he's sitting in the break room, and he sees the deck of cards, and he's playing with them, and he's answering the questions and testing his own knowledge on sustainability, and he sees a, you know, 16 vending machines in this break room, because it's pretty large. And each vending machine is not only stocked with product, but it's got lights, it's got sound cards playing the Coca-Cola commercial. It's got flashing bells and whistles. And he thinks, you know, I actually don't need to get a lighted Snickers bar. I actually probably don't need to hear the Coca-Cola commercial to order a Coke. I wonder what would happen if we just pulled out the light bulbs, unscrewed them, and pulled out the sound cards in all of our vending machines. Would this save us money? Because for this company, efficiency is their number one business objective. So he emails the CEO and says, I have an idea. What do you think? Even though this is a very large company, it's typical for an employee to be able to email the CEO. The CEO emails a guy named Matt Kistler, who's their sustainability director, and says, what do you think about this idea from North Carolina? The sustainability director emails the engineer lead, and the engineer lead crunches some numbers and finds that they would save a million dollars by taking out all the lights in their vending machines across the United States in their stores. Who's the company? Walmart. Every employee at Walmart is trained in how to be personally sustainable how to turn off the water when you're brushing your teeth. All kinds of really small, remember we want small, easy, bite-sized chunks of things that we can do and do well and check it off our list. And so because Daryl had been trained individually of how to think more efficiently, what does he do on the job? The same thing. He tries to figure out how to be more efficient. Now, how do you think Daryl Myers now feels towards Walmart because he's just saved the company a million dollars? And he gets a personal kudos, no raise, I'm sure. But he gets a personal pat on the back from the CEO, and it's huge. And in fact, Walmart is doing an incredibly effective job of training their 160,000 employees on how they can individually become more sustainable. And that is who is developing, who has eventually developed Walmart's sustainability strategy, is their own employees, because they 
run the business day to day, not some sustainability director who's in a fancy office in Bentonville, Arkansas. They see ways in which the company can become more sustainable. So start inside, or at least concurrently, talk outside and engage inside. It's a very effective strategy, and your employees are just a, a, a missed opportunity as it come, relates to sustainability. Another strategy in terms of branding is for companies to know who their consumers are and who they are not, who they want their consumers to be. Because my research on diversity shows that there are certain segments of the market who are much more ready and open and engaged with sustainability strategies and messaging. And again, I can't talk about all of them. You saw millennials in action. Millennials are, or Generation Y are people today between the ages of 8 and 24. My daughter's a millennial, so when she just saw a sign on a wall about paper and trees and animals, she got the connection because this generation gets it better than any generation in the past. They've seen a pretty screwed up world in their existence. They feel personally responsible, which was what my generation did, but they have a third attribute that generations previous did not have, and it's that they feel personally powerful. They actually feel like, I can make a change, whereas my generation screwed up because we thought the world was pretty messed up, uh, we said we wanted to do something about it, but at the end of the day, we drove our SUV back to our really 6,000 square foot big house, turned on the air, and watched TV. This generation says, we can actually do something here. We can do something with our purchase power. We can do something with our blogs. We can do something with our videos on YouTube. We can do something with my MySpace page. We can do something with my wallet, or better yet, my parents' wallets. And we can influence how a company behaves. The audience I'm going to talk about tonight briefly is the female audience because I like the female audience, because I am one. So we know why companies care about women. They control upwards of, if not more than, 80% of the purse strings. And I'm convinced that of the 20% we don't control, we're probably dictating about 18% of that spend. We're just having somebody else, a man, go out and buy it. But we're telling them what we, what we want. So as consumers, it's a win-win proposition for companies to use CSR branding in a way to attract women to purchase their products. All of the research vehemently supports that in each of the 50 states, women are much more likely than our men to volunteer in their communities. Women are much more likely to investigate a company's social and environmental performance more than a man would. They're much more likely to screen their own investment portfolio, not give up financial return, but not ignore environmental or social impact that the company's making in order to have a huge financial return. So they're much more likely to invest in socially screened funds. They're much more likely to ensure that workers are paid a fair wage to produce an item. The piece of it that I'm most interested in and I'm writing about now is not so much females as consumers, but females as employees. How many of you are in business school? So at, Carol, at UNC, right? How many women are in your classes? 28%. 28%, the average is 27%, so you're doing better than average, of MBA programs are populated by women. So that might not sound very crazy to you. You know, I, I once took a, a group of second year MBA students out to lunch, and we got to talking about how I dress in the classroom. They were, you know, because I was in shorts that day, and they, they couldn't get over it. Like, you, you don't look like yourself. And I said, well, I'm not teaching today. And I said, well, why do you dress up for class? They said, don't all your professors dress up for class? And they kind of looked at me funny. I said, well, at least all your female professors, don't they all dress up for class? These are second year MBA students. You know what they told me? You're our first female MBA professor. Like, wait, what? You're graduating. Yeah, you are our only female MBA professor. So my first thought is, no wonder we only have 27% MBA students as women, because there's nobody to look at in the classroom who relates to that, who looks like them. But the other data that I got, became very fascinated by was, I know that 60% of US college students who are graduating college are women. So I know the pipeline's there. It's not the pipeline theory. I looked at medicine and law. Uh, medicine's 50-50. Law is 60-40, women to men. So I'm like, what's the problem with MBA programs? Why are there not more women? So of course I look at the research, and the research suggests a very simple strategy, a very simple reason. Women aren't engaged in business because it's not family friendly. It's hard to have a child and work in business. And I thought, okay, that's, that's a reasonable solution, and that possibly explains some of the variance, and it could even explain 50% of the variance, but you know, I've been a soccer mom for a summer when I've taken some time off, and it's really just not all that fun. It's not all that stimulating. You don't you know, get to talk about interesting things. I mean, it's, sometimes it's inter interesting to hear about who tripped who on the, on the field, or who's a better goalie, or 
why this kid, but it's just, it's not fun. So I thought this doesn't seem right to me, that women are just opting out of business to go home and raise kids and be a soccer mom. I mean, I get that, and that's a, there's, some, there's some truth to that. But I think there's possibly another hypothesis, which is what I'm testing right now in my research. Is it possible that women have an inherent need, because I already know about their purchase um, trends, that they purchase products, if a, they're much more likely to purchase a product if a percentage of that product is earmarked towards a cause or a belief that they care about. They're much more likely to volunteer in their classrooms. And in fact, the women who I know in my kids' school who don't work, who opted out, they work far harder than I do. They run the PTA, they run the school auction, they run the walkathon. I mean, these people are working hard. So it's not this fear of hard work or work-life balance. They're working. But is it possible that they don't view business as being socially beneficial? And that women, because of, I've seen their purchase behaviors, have an innate desire to do something with their life that is socially beneficial, as well as make money, as well as get promoted, as well as rise up to the ranks? Do they want to do something that is more socially beneficial? Because if they're not leaving law, the profession of law, and they're not leaving the profession of, of medicine, but they are leaving the profession of business, what gives? Because I don't know too many doctors who have splendid work-life balance, or too many lawyers who have great work-life balance. But sometimes I think it's easy to imagine that being a lawyer makes the world a better place because I'm fighting for justice. Being a doctor makes the world a better place because I'm healing people. Yeah, business, I I'm just making money. And it's not all that challenging or interesting to me at the end of the day. And in my research is actually proving this out, that women, fast-tracked women, leave the workforce out of a lack of personal satisfaction. I'm not saying there isn't work-life balance. I'm not saying there's not a glass ceiling. Those things all exist, but there's another piece of it that we're forgetting to talk about in the research which is that women don't view business or people don't view business as an agent for positive social change. So then I started to go and look at some corporate social responsibility initiatives inside of companies. And it turns out that they are heavily participated in and populated by women. The first one I looked at was Pfizer's Global Health Fellows Program, where they'll send Pfizer employees out into the developing world, into the field for three months to work with NGOs to, to help build healthcare capacity. The first year they launched this, they were looking for 20 fellows to send out in the field. 100% of their applicants were women. And the CEO, Hank McKinnell, said, this is not a diversity program. Where are all the men? So this is something that I really want businesses to take to heart. I don't want CSR departments to be populated only by women. That is not at all what I'm saying. But engaging and talking about your corporate social responsibility as a human resources strategy to both attract these fabulous women MBA candidates who are in the audience and retain your fast-track female managers has proved to be a really effective strategy. The lioness up there is because I was telling this, I was talking about this research to uh, Bobby Shriver. I was doing some work on Product Red uh, with Bono and Bobby Shriver, although I only got to work with Bobby Shriver, so I never got to meet Bono. But I was telling him about this because he was ha at the time he was having a hard time getting American Express U.S. to sign on to Product Red. They'd signed on in Europe, but not in the U.S. And as I dug a little bit more deeply, one of American Express U.S.'s business challenges was that they weren't attracting female card owners. The card their, their market segment was typically a, a, an older, middle-aged to older white man, and they really wanted to attract a young, hip, and female cardholder audience. And I just casually said to Bobby, "Well, gosh, then Product Red is perfect because it's a red." American Express card on the back, it has a really simple statement. This card helps fight AIDS. Like it makes sense, it's direct, it's dead, it's dead on simple. So we got to talk and he said, would you fly up to New York and present to American Express in your research? And I said, sure, I was a banker, I love nothing more than to go in there and try to get banks to be more socially responsible. And on the plane, he was looking at my paper, my paper had this really long academic title with a colon, you know, everything that an academic title is supposed to do and it didn't mean anything. And he said, geez, you should call this the lioness factor. And I said, okay, that'd be a great title, but why? And he told me a story that he and Bono were in Bobby Shriver's Santa Monica recording studio, and they were pitching Product Red to P. Diddy, or Puff Daddy, or Sean Combs, whatever he's decided to, to be called this week. And they wanted P. Diddy to, to do advertising pro bono for Product Red. And according to Bobby, Bono did his pitch, and then Bobby was doing his pitch, and P. Diddy just interrupted them and said, you know what, guys, shut up. He's like, just shut up. I'm sick of hearing from you. And he points to Bono which kind of made my knees shake, because I can't imagine saying that to Bono. And he points to Bobby Shriver, he's like, and I'm sick of hearing from you, this campaign is doomed to failure, because you're a bunch of lions. And Bobby said he and Bono looked at each other, and were like, do you know what he's talking about? No, do you know what he's talking about? And P. Diddy went on and said, you know what lions do every day, all day? Does anybody know? Sleep. 
They get up, they saunter over to the largest shade tree that they can find in the jungle, and they plop back down and they go to sleep, take a nap. The lioness gets up, takes care of the cubs, goes out and kills, hunts, kills, and gathers the food and brings it back for the sleeping lion. And his comment to them was actually pretty prescient. He said, this campaign is doomed to failure until you get some lionesses involved. And sure enough, they went out and pitched it to Penelope Cruz, to Mary J. Blige, to Oprah, the queen lioness of the jungle. <laughs> they launched Product Red on Oprah on October 13th in 2006. The web, by the way, Apple had said no repeatedly to Product Red. Guess who called on October 12th at midnight and said, we want to be a part of Product Red? Apple, because they knew they were launching on Oprah the next day. So they had five brands in their initial launch. And the website traffic, e-commerce website traffic, for the five original brands in Product Red went up 26,000% in the hour after Oprah. So it turns out I learned something from P. Diddy, which is the lioness factor. <laughs> Finally, the book really focuses on how to tell your story, why to tell your story, but tell your story. Because most companies, can, I can teach them corporate social responsibility strategy. I can go in and consult with them and help them develop an effective corporate social responsibility strategy. And they stop there. They simply don't go to the next step, which is to tell their story. Have the substance and content first. Don't tell your story, and then develop your substance and content. Companies give me all kinds of excuses why they don't communicate their corporate social responsibility. All of it has variations of truth in it. My comment is you can't not communicate. Because by not communicating, you are, in fact, communicating that you do nothing in this space, which is not a good thing. And if you don't communicate it, somebody else will communicate for you. Or somebody else will communicate for you, I'm sorry, for them, like Dell, and grab market share from you, HP, if you don't communicate. Others will tell your story first. And even though I am in the hallowed halls of a top business school, and I do understand the value of statistical rigor and analysis, and quantitative rigor and analysis, every single survey of what, cons what impacts a consumer says that they don't get all that analysis. They don't remember your price to earnings ratio. They don't remember your share price. Stories trump facts, not five times out of 10, not seven times out of 10, but 10 times out of 10. Stories are what stick with people, whether it's an employee, whether it's a supplier, whether it's a, a government official and you're trying to move into this locale, whether it's a consumer when they're in a store and every refrigerator looks alike. Stories trump facts 10 times out of 10, so don't forget to tell the story. Have the facts, have the metrics, have the analysis to back up your story but tell your story. The company who I think has done this absolutely, completely efficiently is Dove, which is owned by Unilever. Dove, as most of you probably know, has the Real Women campaign, the Real Beauty campaign, where they highlight real women. And what the underlying purpose of the campaign is to redefine the global definition of beauty. So they did heavy research to go around the world to determine how beauty is defined in each global arena. And this is US branding. This is some of their print ads. It says, fat or fit? Does true beauty only squeeze into size eight? Join the beauty debate. Wizened or wonderful? Will society ever accept old can be beautiful? Join the beauty debate. I'll show you a quick video clip. See, Dove could go up there and brand their deodorant, 
their body lotion. They could show you a picture of a woman slathering lotion on her legs, which is what most people do in their space. Or they could do this. And how do you think it feels? If you watch this commercial and you happen to work for Dove, or you're a brand manager at Dove, how, does, how do you think it makes you feel towards your company? How do you think it makes you feel when you miss your daughter's soccer game because you're working on the Real, Real Beauty campaign for Dove? I mean, it differentiates them from their competitors leaps and bounds, and they've picked a problem not only for which they can help contribute a solution, but they helped cause, because they're in the beauty industry, healthcare and beauty products. It's edgy, it's highly risky. The, you know, I have a lot of more Dove stories in the book. Some of the stuff is incredibly edgy with how they brand and communicate it. They've got a fantastic YouTube video that's viral that's not on television that just makes me cry every time I see it, and I've seen it over a thousand times, which has little girls talking about how they feel ugly. Or one little girl says, you know, the first time I was told ugly, I was 10, and I had never been told that before. Like, can you imagine a girl going to school and being told she's ugly? Um, I just heard a great story about this. This is not in the book, but I was giving a talk about this campaign, and a woman in the audience had come from Ogilvy, and she said that the first two times Ogilvy pitched this campaign to the Dove senior um, executives, they hated it. Because the first iteration of the campaign was the real women campaign. Remember the real normal looking women in their underwear and bras? So they pitched this concept of real looking women, and these, these Dove executives said, Ugh, I hate it. And so they rejected it twice. So unbeknownst, the third pitch, the, the Ogilvy young creative folks had gone out and, and videotaped some interviews with the executives' daughters of how they felt about their bodies, about their face, about their hair. And they went in to do the pitch, and they you know, pitched pretty much what they had pitched the previous two times, but they interjected a few video spots of the executives' little girls saying how they felt fat at age five. And they were just trying to subtly make the point, like, this is a real problem in the world, guys, and you could be part of the solution. And the story is that they, they selected it and that that's how it became as big as it's come today. It has had significant impact. It has had uh, significant impact on the company, significant impact on the, the global debate around beauty. I've been to so many companies right now, banks, who want to do the same kind of a campaign, like a bank to even get that they need to brand and advertise is the first big surprise there, but that they're benchmarking the Dove Real Women campaign is huge. It's just been a brilliant campaign. It's based on loads and loads of content, substance, and research. They failed miserably. The first time they ran the Super Bowl commercial with the Real Women, they actually linked it to a product that was an anti-cellulite cream. Whoops. But this is classic, a company viewing it as a feel-good activity, not a branding strategy, so they didn't link it to the right product because they didn't talk to each other. They then got it right and they linked it to another more benign beauty product or healthcare product. And you know, branders live and die by focus group data. So they did this huge launch of normal looking women in a bra and underwear. They ran off the next week and did all their focus groups and they got all this negative feedback back from, from the campaign. Who do you think the negative feedback came from? Men. They were like, ugh. I just saw a woman who looks like my wife, the size of a bus, <laughs> Go by my building today. Like, I don't want to see that. I go home and see that every night. I want to see Claudia Schiffer. I want to see a Victoria's Secret model on a billboard that's the size of a 10-story building. They hated it. And that's a, you know, we laugh about it and you can imagine it, but it's hard for somebody who's just spent this much money to go back and argue that it's a good campaign when they've got negative focus group data. But because Dove had done such extensive research first for the first three years, they knew that one, one of the single biggest contributing factors to a girl and her sense of self-esteem is her relationship with her father or her father figure. So they decided that it's okay if we're rankling men a little bit. Because you know what, they're part of the problem too. So this is good. So it's just been a brilliant campaign, a lot more in the book. So I want to wrap up. We have to be out of here by seven-ish, is that right? And I want to have time for some questions. But the, the, the thing that I want to tell you about corporate responsibility right now, if done well, if done strategically, if done effectively, and if, if communicated, is that it gives hope. And so the original title of my book was Branding Hope, and I was so psyched about that title. And I even started to go out and give a few talks on this concept of branding hope. And then Barack Obama came out <laughs> and wrote this book called The Audacity of Hope. So my title got thrown by the wayside. But I think this New Yorker cartoon sums it up very eloquently, that we live in a period today in which this woman, who's very well dressed, goes into a boutique and says, what would you suggest to fill the dark, empty spaces in my soul? We live in a world in which people are absolutely devoid of hope. 
and they're searching frantically for hope. And I think companies can offer a significant part of that solution with branding their corporate social responsibility work. So thank you very much. The book, it's on Amazon.com right now at deep discounts, even though it's a pre-order and you'll get it when it comes out. I'd love to entertain questions to the extent that you have them or comments on what resonated with you or free drink coupons. <laughs> Go work at McDonald's. This is a company who is so completely paralyzed by criticism, by negative feedback. Oh, sorry. Um, he, he asked why, why aren't companies communicating their CSR? Because his view of big companies is that they don't care if they're criticized. They don't care what people think about them. I've never worked inside of a company who doesn't care. You know, it's, it's, curious. it's a great question, actually, because it's something I've struggled with in my personal life. Like, I don't care what people say about me, but then I go home and cry for three hours after somebody said they didn't like me. And I hear, I hear this concept of companies, yeah, I've never ever been inside of a company where it's run by humans, it's not this machine, it's humans. And I've never been inside a company who didn't care, not only who didn't care what people are thinking about, but are out looking for what people are thinking about them. So McDonald's is a great example. McDonald's actually has done a lot of work in the area of social responsibility, primarily around, well, certainly with the Ronald McDonald House, which treats 5,000 families a day of direly ill kids. They don't brand that, they don't communicate that. You know, until I started doing work with McDonald's, I had no idea how much they did through the Ronald McDonald House. And my comment was, guys, this should be on my Happy Meal box that I buy for my kid. Because I'm buying a meal for my kid, which, by the way, comes with milk and carrot sticks. I want to know that you're helping sick kids, the families of sick kids across the world. That's huge. But they're so scared to communicate it because they said we're just going to get criticized. They've done a lot for Ronald McDonald. They've done a lot around food safety and quality. And they've done a lot around um, McDonald's being seen as a dead-end job. I mean, the CEO of McDonald's started out as a burger flipper. It is not a dead-end job place for people who want to go in and excel. But they're so paralyzed to criticism. And my comment to them is, hey, guys, guess what? Little known secret, you're the biggest food company in the world. You're going to get criticized, period. Doesn't just, that's just what people are going to do. So pick your poison. Do you want to be criticized for styrofoam packaging, or do you want to be criticized for being the first fast food company who got rid of styrofoam packaging and all the other fast food companies followed suit? Or do you want to be the first fast food company who got rid of supersized products? And guess what Burger King did the week after McDonald's got rid of supersized products? They doubled their menu offering of supersized products, and they picked up significant market share from McDonald's because the average American is not asking for smaller portion sizes. So my comment to companies is they actually really are frightened of what people are going to say or big campaigns waged against them. And I say pick your poison because they're going to be waged against you anyway. There are far worse things to be criticized for than trying to do good in the world. Yes? You know, the jury is still out. It's, it's always the company that gets brought up as the reason to not be socially responsible, because look at Exxon, they're so incredibly um, successful. I've done a tiny bit of work with Stephen Phillips, who's a doctor at Exxon. He's um, the physician who's on the commercial talking about there. He was actually on, um, on um, American Idol when uh, this last Idol Gives Back. That was one of the causes that, that we support, that my kids supported, because they called in and gave 100 bucks. Um, my sense of Exxon is that they have been doing good work. It's not strategic. They've been doing it like most companies have been doing it, philanthropically, foundation-wise, and they just haven't talked about it yet. So I'm not sure if they ha are as bad. I mean, I'm not saying if they are good or bad in the ways that you think they're bad, but I think they've been doing a lot of good behind the scenes. They just haven't talked about it. So I'm not sure that their profit is linked to being completely socially irresponsible as much as we like to think it is. I don't know if it's too little too late because of the 23rd largest economy. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so here's the crazy thing about branding surveys. If you look at global data, if you ask global citizens, who, are, who, who do you think the most five socially responsible companies are? They'll name five companies. If you then say, who do you think the five least socially responsible companies are? They'll name three of the five same companies. 
for two reasons. One, I just don't think consumers know who's socially responsible and who isn't because I don't think companies are effectively communicating. When I walk into a store and I want to buy a bottle of water, I'm not sure I know which is the more socially responsibly produced water unless it says so in the bottle or the hang tag. So one is I just don't think consumers know how to answer that question because they just don't know. It's perception. So the second thing a consumer does in that situation because they don't want to look stupid is just name the most five popular brands that they know about. So it's kind of tricky data because Exxon is such a well-known brand that they probably would be served well by branding more of their social responsibility because they're already a well-known brand. They probably have an easier job of making it into those surveys because people know their name, know their brand. You know, and again, I tend to, I have, again, I have this great job because I don't look at Exxon and their CSR strategy. I look at Dr. Phillips and I think, you know what, for a Stanford-trained immunologist to go to work for Exxon, like crazy guy. If he wanted to go save the world, there are a lot of places he could have done it much more efficiently and effectively than Exxon. He's brilliant. If we're going to fight AIDS and malaria in Africa, oil companies have to be a part of the solution because they're in Africa. They're building roads. They're building schools. They're building hospitals. I actually think they have a fair shot at it because I know the people who are working on the strategy there. Um, Jeffrey Sachs said something once that had a profound impact on me because at the time I was doing a lot of work. I still am, but I just started doing a lot of work in Haiti. And Jeffrey Sachs, we were at a conference together, and he was addressing a group of corporate CEOs. And for, the, for, the, for a rare moment, he was actually feeling um, connected to these corporate CEOs because he's much more known for attacking corporations. But he said, you know, I can imagine it's really hard for you guys to be CEOs, and it's mostly men. Um, it's probably you have a really hard job right now because people don't trust companies. They don't think you're doing anything to change the world in a good way. And he said, on the other hand, I say that if you think it's bad being exploited by a multinational corporation, try being ignored by one. And I think about that in Haiti, because Haiti has completely been ignored by corporations. And it's a pretty tough road ahead. So if I, again, had to put money on who's going to help fight AIDS and malaria in Africa, I'd put money on an oil company who's already in there with the infrastructure. They have to be part of the solution. And I think Exxon's getting there. I haven't done extensive work for them, though. So it's a good question. How about in the red, red and black? Because you're a Catholic, right? I'm not, my mom said. And, <laughs> and your mom told you that you weren't supposed to talk about putting money in the basket on Sunday. Because if you talked about it, then it was no longer good. Yeah. You're supposed to hide it under the pew. Exactly. So it's not Turn around. I have the same mom as you. <laughs> yeah. So that we know what they're saying is true? Oh, I see. The communication piece of it. Well, you, you have a couple of embedded questions in there. One is, how do we know if they're lying? It would be so stupid in today's world, and how quickly my sister sent me a video of Sarah Palin when I emailed her and said, oh my god, I'm going to shoot myself because somebody told me I look like Sarah Palin today. <laughs> and she sent me a video of Sarah Palin that showed her in this slinky little, whatever, nightgown and how beautiful she was. But people get information quickly. So for any company to think that they can get away at all by putting out a national campaign that lies, that's just, that's just stupid, period. So I don't think that companies are going to lie about this stuff, not to mention it's an expensive campaign. So I used to spend money online. This doesn't seem, um, I almost started to go off into a political dialogue there, but I'm not. <laughs> so the second thing is, in terms of this independent ver uh, verification or rating system, there are a lot of attempts out there. The challenge right now is that the demand completely outstrips the supply. And even with the rating systems, I mean, nothing, it's so funny because we think we had independent financial rating systems that are absolutely foolproof, and it turns out, Splat. That didn't exist at all. So why we think we can have it with corporate social response, I don't think it's going to exist. That's not to say there aren't attempts out there. I think the biggest challenge is how to get the, the information in small bite-sized information. Some of the most, um, I think, interesting work right now is, is looking at text information or um, cell phone information where you can be in a store, pull up TVs, and it will catalog sort of the, most, the five most socially responsibly produced TVs because people want things fast in bite-sized pieces. Yes. How about two more questions? And then I'm sensitive to the fact that there is a group of immigration lawyers coming in here, and I don't really want to <laughs> piss them off. For, uh, for hopeful entrepreneurs who are looking to start their own companies, um, is there anything additional or different um, that you would recommend to project the integrity of CSR from the very beginning? Yeah, it's a great question. I just met with two, um, two, social, two, two not social entrepreneurs, two entrepreneurs who graduated from Haas five years ago, and they're building a 
online travel portal, for, particularly to focus on Central and South America. And they kind of came in and said, and we want to be socially responsible. And their strategy was like huge, what they wanted to do in terms of social responsibility. And I said, hey, guys, you, you just want to get a company off the ground. So pick one thing, very small, very focused, very much linked to increasing sales or increasing revenue. Because as a new company, you've got to be hyper-focused, laser-focused on increasing revenue. I think a social entrepreneur or a entrepreneur, I shouldn't assume that you're a social entrepreneur has an easier job because you can build it. You're not going back and retrofitting a huge company and trying to go back and reteach. You can build it in from the start, but make it very focused and laser sharp. Think, of, think about your corporate strategy classes and everything that makes a good corporate strategy makes also a good social responsibility strategy and engage your employees because you just don't have the resources and partner. And one thing I haven't talked about at all, and it's actually a little bit of an answer to your question, partner with people who have more resources than you when you're talking about communication, Whirlpool is very smart to have Habitat do a lot of their communications for them on this campaign. Because it doesn't matter if Habitat's lying profusely, people think they're trustful. People think Whirlpool's not trustful because they're a company. So get your partners to communicate and do some work for you. How about one more question, and then I will move out into the hallway and take other questions so the next group can, can get ready. Yeah. Yeah. It's not going to solve everything. You know, I think um, because we do live in a world so devoid of hope, we want to take any solution and think it's going to completely change the world and solve it. It's just a piece of the puzzle. I still think that Wall Street has to get on board, and they are. Goldman Sachs is heavily on board, and they now valuate firms not only based on financial, but on environment. They call it ESG, environment, social, and governance factors. Uh, it's got to be built into the valuation system in terms of a balance and checks against quarterly earnings. I think the government has got to get involved in terms of regulating some of this. But the question that you're asking brings me to actually one of the points I'm most sad about in the area of corporate social responsibility. I think the pendulum has, has swung so heavily towards corporations solving every problem in the world that we don't have any individual responsibility anymore. So I can sit there and hate Exxon and hate Ford, but still feel good about driving an SUV when I only have two people or one person in it every day. So I think somehow the public dialogue has got to swift the, you know, move the pendulum a little bit back more towards individual responsibility. That has to be a part of the solution as well. We can't expect companies to do it all. It's just not a sustainable strategy. But, but it's a piece of the puzzle. Should we end, Tracy, so we can get the professors in here or the lawyers? Thank you. It's not Duke, Dad. It's Carolina. <laughs> Carolina Thank Park. you very much. Um, our next upcoming sort of event will be in November. Gary Hirschberg, who is the CEO of Stonyfield Farms, is going to be giving a talk on Central Campus, and there'll be lots of information out about that. Um, if you're not on our mailing list for the Center for Sustainable Enterprise, there's a place to sign up.